my name is Tesco V, and uh, I'm the creator of Touch and Go, uh, the hardcore fanzine. Uh, I've always been really passionate about music, and even as a little boy, I remember those moments when I first heard certain songs and the feelings that I had, and, and I uh, just, I've always felt strongly about, you know, it was a big part of my life, and then um, when the 70s, I think to me the 70s is like the best musical decade of all time, because it had so many different styles of music, and um, I just embraced everything, all the, the, uh, the glam and the glitter bands and the hard rock, and then when punk happened, it, it was a game changer. Anybody could be a band, anybody could write and record and and get on stage and it broke down the barriers and that's what I liked about it and that's what made me want to be a band, have a band, write songs and just act like a lunatic on stage. We're gonna rock you, we're gonna sock you, we're gonna shake you, we're gonna bake you, we're gonna razz them on ass up your ass! I want to say I started the band first and then I felt the need to write about there was just so much going on and I needed to write about it so and, uh, myself and Dave Stimson, we went to high school together at Opamus and we met at a concert over, um, there was a place called The Stables and there was a band called Coldcock from Detroit that was playing and we, and I just saw him there and we just started talking and we had nothing in common in high school. I was a hippie freak and he was the fo star football player. So we were in completely different universes in high school but then when we start talking about music, we connected, and it was a great partnership. Some of that stuff we just made up ourselves. Like we'd have the, yeah, the, yeah. We had fun with it though. We would get a few, a few responses, but mostly it was just us making stuff up to be stupid. Number one. So yeah, that's pretty cool. It's just from some magazine. That I cut out. That's what it, that was. It was the you know it was all cut and paste. And just I remember we'd get together and play records and and just he called me one day and he said I have this Black Flag record in the mail and it was the first record, the Nervous Breakdown record and I was just blown away and just it's one of those moments where you you remember where you were when you heard a certain record. So yeah, Dave, he lived this with his parents. And I lived in a small apartment in Williamston. And he would do his half of the magazine, I would do my half, and then we'd get together and drink a bunch of beer, and we'd read each other's and laugh and put it all together. It started off, I was just doing it at school, and you know, I can't remember where I did each issue, but that's why some of the copies are, are, in, are in yellow, and some are in green, and some are in pink, because there was pink, you know, I found a bunch of pink paper at the school, so I'm like, well, I'll steal the pink paper this time, so. That's why the, the colors are different, and so yeah, I mean, I didn't do all of them at the school. But eventually, I started to go to a print shop in East Lansing, and I don't remember, it was right there on, uh, on Abbott. And then, eventually, I went to an offset printing, I went to a print shop, and I lived in Virginia. When, when I moved to D.C., Dave moved to D.C., and then I moved shortly thereafter. We, he didn't want to do the magazine anymore, but I did, I think, four or five more issues by myself. Uh, actually, the last few issues were actually offset printed, and, you know, you can see that the, it's much, much, well, this was not stapled anymore, but you can see that the quality is a lot better than the Xerox, and he went, oh gee, we went full color on our on our centerfold here, pretty fancy. And he, we had, did have people that subscribed to it, though, believe it or not. We would mail them out to different fanzines and mail them to record labels, and then a few would sell, but we weren't making any money on it. Subscriptions, you know, you could send like, what, $4.50 mm -hmm. for a subscription. There's a story I Ian Mackay, I think it's in that in the the book where he went to a place in Arlington and saw, you know, because he thought it was a very coastal phenomenon. You had L.A. and you had the East Coast and West Coast, and he saw this fanzine from Lansing, Michigan, and he was like, "Weird, what? There's life in Lansing, Michigan?" And uh, and yet there there is, and uh, believe it or not. And, um, 
we did a book signing at FBC uh -huh. and one of my students came. And then like maybe 10 years ago, I was having a root canal, believe it or not, and this girl right behind the front desk is like, hey, you used to teach school? And I was like, yeah, I said, you were my teacher. You were great, you were a great teacher, you know, so I love hearing that, you know, because it was fun. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of worlds collide, because I was doing punk shows at night, and then, or going to Detroit and seeing the Cramps, or, or you know, other bands like that, and then I'd drive back and go to teach school, you know, so it was kind of a, when you're a school teacher, in a farm, you know, Williamson at that time was a pretty farm town, it wasn't like now, it is now, it's kind of like fancy and like infamous, but back then it was, uh, it was kind of weird. some new lines for you. None of this, what's your sign, what are you doing, haven't I seen you somewhere before? You gotta come right to the point, particularly with these Madonna types, you know, the material girls. You simply, you simply walk up to them and say, okay, a gram of nose candy, I washed your 300ZX, you gam the PP. Pee -pee. So we had people that hated us. Still, I have still people that don't like me because of things I said. Like I called one guy the biggest drunk in town, and even to this day, he's still a drunk, and he's not happy about it. I mean, it was such a small magazine, but it was a small town back then, too, so. We would make fun, if we didn't like a band, we'd make fun of them. We'd say, that band sucks, don't go see them, you know, and then that band would read it, and then we'd give us dirty looks, and. But we always shot from the hip, we always told exactly how, you know, we always tried to express ourselves. We didn't, no BS, no, None of this, like music magazines, all this rough, you know, everything's great, everything's not great. Some stuff sucks, and we told it like it was. I still have a P.O. box at Collins Road. Not the same one I had in the day, but I still go there. Nobody ever sends mail anymore. I mean, it's just tumbleweeds in there, but um, I'd get a, you know, we'd get records from the West Coast, from the Minutemen, from Minor Threat, from... Husker Du, people with G.G. Allen sent us his first record. I mean, we got records all the time, and we'd review them, and sometimes we liked them, sometimes we didn't. And, and we traded zines with other zines. It was just part of the culture back then. There was no internet, there was no way of getting information out there, sort of writing. You had to write a letter. We put two dollars in, like I sent Fear, Lee Ving, my two dollars for his record, you know, and he actually sent me a record. Mm -hmm. It's shocking. Just what you'll be doing when you're 64, when you're 25. I guess I need some new friends. It's like this huge influx of music and people writing about music and 45s, and it's just a really great time to uh, be alive. The very beginning, there was um, forced exposure. Was came a little bit later, and from Boston, they model. I think they kind of model themselves after Touch and Go. There was your the early on. There was uh, well, the big takeover. Um, there was so oh, man, just just so many of them back then. Well, Slash and Search and Destroy were really zines. They were kind of like big newsprint publications, one from LA and one from San Francisco, but those were really inspirational for me. They were like zines. Well, at Flat Black and Circular was around back then. There was School Kids Records in Ann Arbor, there was Yazoo Records in Ann Arbor, there was Dearborn Music, which I believe is still in business, and they would just get all these obscure 45s and we'd review them. And so you see some of the 45s in the Touch and Go, they're like, whoever heard of this, even to this day, whoever heard of this? There's probably like 50 copies pressed, and well, we would kind of pride ourselves on, oh man, you got to get this record. We knew no one could find it, so it was kind of like, kind of a joke. Things go in phases and cycles, and that 1983, I just kind of felt like, I wasn't feeling the newness in the music scene anymore. I was starting to feel kind of stale. So I just decided to put it, my pen down or my 
typewriter down and stopped doing it. It was about the same time I, I was working at, like, pumping newspapers, working at a record store and interviewing bands and, and um, in, right in Georgetown, which is right, right, you know, right downtown D.C. It was great. I mean, it was a great time, but just music-wise, there was just nothing new happening, so it was just time to stop. You're too pushed on Saturday night and you sit home and watch a morph from Org, you dork. And it took us five years to find someone to put it out. And Steve Miller, who is the singer of The Fix, and he's now he's an investigative journalist, he helped me. We shopped it all over. We had a couple publishers that wanted to make it smaller. It's too big, it's too big. And then finally my lawyer, um, I believe my lawyer found uh, and Christy and the Brazilian points and it was just a perfect, he said make it as big as you want it. That's why we added all those flyers and letters from Ian Mackay in there. We got people to, you know, like Henry Rollins and Keith Morris to do uh, intros for us and it was just, it just worked out. It just worked out great. Club Doobie is, 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 a, is now called The Watershed. It's in like Hazlitt and believe it or not Black Flag played there. These are some flyers. This is a uh, meet men at a skate park show. Here's uh, some flyer from DC. The Fix. This is a record I put out. Because you know Dave and I kind of lost touch, and there, you know we didn't speak for a while. I think he's, I don't know what was wrong, but we weren't speaking for a while. And then when the book came out, we got together again, and like we went to, to a bookstore in Greenwich Village and. They must have had 50 copies stacked up on the counters, and we sat and signed them. And, and we've gotten together a few times. We did a one in Detroit. You know, we've done a few book events together. We did FBC together. He spent more time shopping than he did signing. <laughs> he was he wasn't as idealistic as I was because I was like, oh, I, the music was so important. I had to write about it. And his take is we were just bored. We were bored teenagers. We needed to. I, mean, I wasn't a teenager, I was 24, but, you know, we were just bored. We wanted to write, you know, get free records and... I like to get a reaction out of people, whether it's, you know, make them mad or make them laugh or anything but boring. I like, I want a reaction, some kind of visceral reaction to what, that's my, music is kind of performance art, it's kind of like riling up the crowd. Like that song, Cripple Children Suck, obviously I don't think Cripple Children Suck, I was just going for shock value. So, I was smoking a doobie on my couch thinking, what can I write about that'll get people's attention? So that's, uh, that's where I'm coming from on that. But the wonder if I'm serious. Like, is he serious? He can't be serious. I think he's serious. That kind of, that, that's what I'm going for. For me, punk is like, there has to be an element of danger. Like, back shows back in the days, you, when something was in the air, like you didn't know what was gonna happen next. Like, the crowd was huge, and the crowd was moving, and there was pockets of this going on, and there was just this element of, they verging on out of control. To me, that was punk at its essence. And now, it, it gave me a, it gave me like a vehicle uh, to express myself. I was like an English major at Michigan State. So, and my mom was like, I credit my mom with a lot of my success because even though she never had a day of college, she knew the English language better than, and she would correct me if I misspoke and. She would help me rewrite all my college papers on the old typewriter in the basement, like rewording sentence structure and stuff. And she really made me the wordsmith that I am today. And that book is kind of, to me, is a, kind of a testament to my mom in a way, even though she was like religious and would never have, did not approve of my band. But it's four years of my life right there. So it's kind of like I can open it up and look back and fills me with memories and good memories of sitting and chain smoking and reviewing records and drinking gin in my little apartment and, and uh, it was a great time.
I think it was essential. I mean, I'm a little close to it, but because uh, nobody else was down there taking pictures and doing reviews of the shows, and and um, we started to, you know, we brought other bands in, and so yeah, it was at the time it was very influential. It kind of was the the fanzine for the Midwest. There was nothing like that. I mean, it was strictly us. And all the other little scenes all connected by people writing letters and sending magazines and writing zines. What was so cool about it. It was like allowed to sort of become what it was instead of the internet just passing in five minutes. It's on the internet. And I'm happy that there's a testament to it. So long after I'm dead, people can pick that up and go, ah, oh, that's who Tesco B was.